All right, good morning. My name is Steve London, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the breakfast this morning. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our fourth annual Jewish National Fund breakfast. Please direct your attention to the video for just a few minutes. Some of the world's greatest influencers come from humble beginnings. We'd wager that only one of them could claim to be a tin box. Nobody could have foretold the impact of the Jewish National Fund's blue box or how much larger than its physical size it would become. It all began in the year of 1901. Theodore Herzl was speaking in Basel, Switzerland, addressing the Fifth Zionist Congress. His goal, the immediate creation of a national fund allowing the purchase of land in Israel and the reestablishment of a Jewish homeland. His tool, the hat off his head. Two weeks later, the vessel was refined. Resembling the charity Sadaka box is commonly used in synagogues, the blue box was created, small, tin, and yes, blue. Hundreds of blue boxes carrying the words National Fund were manufactured in Vienna, distributed to Jewish communities around the world who contributed as much as they could to make the dream of a Jewish country a reality. People's reactions were extraordinary. By the Second World War, blue box numbers exploded to over a million. Land was repurchased and the dream of a Jewish homeland realized. JNF's blue boxes have become irreplaceable icons. To this day, Jews the world over remember them with nostalgic pride as a symbol of the link between diaspora Jewry and the people of Israel. For the last decade, JNF USA has sent out 100,000 blue boxes each year. These timeless instruments have come to represent all that Jewish National Fund has done and continues to do to build a strong, healthy Israel. An Israel that with all its innovations has earned its nickname, the Startup Nation. These days, JNF's mission has expanded beyond collecting change, encompassing community building, technological and environmental research, river rehabilitation and cutting edge water solutions, making Israel accessible to people with special needs, keeping the Zionist spirit alive and so much more. Still, the boxes have not lost their place in the annals of history. They remain testaments to the power of grassroots giving and connection to a Jewish homeland. Held in hand, a JNF blue box does not feel heavy. A glance through its history, however, shows that one such tin box is worth a nation's weight in gold. It is indeed the greatest startup ever. The box that built a country. Thank you. Once again, my name is Steve London, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the breakfast this morning. Before we begin with our formal part of the program, uh, as supporters of Israel who are faced with terrorism far too often, and with the marathon bombing still all too painful right here in Boston, we certainly understand the pain being endured as a result of the recent acts of terrorism in Paris. This tragedy is one with which we are all too familiar. Paris is in our thoughts. Please take a few moments to reflect on the victims of terrorism throughout the world. Thank you. It's my privilege to recognize a number of our guests here today. First, our distinguished speakers, Seth Siegel and Natav Efrati, we're thrilled to have you here today and we look forward to your remarks. For the other people, I'd like to ask them to stand as I call their name so we all can thank you for your efforts on behalf of Jewish National Fund and Israel. Please hold your applause till I introduce everyone. Our chairman of the board, Jeffrey Davis. Our MC for the morning, David Goodtree. 
Jewish National Fund World Chairman's Council members, Todd and Yadira Patkin, and Mark and Claire Perlman. Our brand new JNF president in Boston, Jeffrey Wolf. Our immediate past president for Boston Jewish National Fund and President Emeritus, Emeritus Michael Blank. The new Deputy Council General of Israel to New England, Matan Zamir. Tali Tzor, JNF's Chief Emissary. And lastly, will my fellow event chairs please stand? Isaac Edry, Judith Sidney, and Judy Elevitz Greenberg. Your hard work and dedication has once again resulted in this wonderful turnout and this great event this morning. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce JNF Director Sarah Hefes. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Sarah Hefes, as Steve London said, your JNF Director for New England, and it's my true pleasure to introduce this morning David Goodtree. David is an active investor and board advisor in technology companies in the US and in Israel. He's a global venture partner and serves on the board of directors for our crowd. David is also the author of the Massachusetts Israel Economic Relationship, a fascinating study which illustrates the impact of Israeli entrepreneurship on the greater Boston community. In the water tech sector and in his role as the founding member of the New England Water Innovation Network, some of David's recent activities include presenting at TEDx Boston and testifying for the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee. David also co-organized co the WET Revolution Competition in Tel Aviv, co-organized the SWIM Symposia, and created the Massachusetts Water Industry Marketing Map. And of course, we're very proud to have him as a JNF Board of Directors member. Please join me in welcoming our MC for the morning, Mr. David Guitry. Yes, that song means the Patriots are 9-0. and oh. For those of you who are raised outside the United States, that song from the 60s, Dirty's Wa Dirty Water, is not only an anthem for Boston sports teams, but an ode to the historically filthy, historically filthy, Charles River which runs right past the Marriott's door to Harvard, MIT, and the Esplanade. It was notoriously foul, full of toxins and abandoned cars. But after a decade of cleanup, it is returned to our community as a beautiful and recreational resource. However, like most rivers, it is not ready for human consumption without treatment. Nobody took on that task until our featured company today, Desalitech, founded in Israel, met Harpoon Brewery, the product of their efforts is a clean, pure, crisp ale, which I see some of you have enjoyed today, but let me let you in on the secret. That table over there has a keg of beer waiting to be finished off this morning. So, and for those of you who have had it, what's the verdict? Is it good? All right. So, Boker Tov. Boker Tov. I hope today's event becomes an annual institution. Welcome to the first ever JNF Beer Breakfast. <laughs> Sarah, thank you for that kind introduction. My role today is to MC our program. We'll hear from Nadav Efrati, the CEO of that impressive Israeli Massachusetts company, Desalitech, and its quest to bring clean, abundant water to the world. 
We'll spend some time with Seth Siegel, author of an inspiring new book, Let There Be Water. We'll learn how the Israeli water industry is bringing not just hope, but know-how to change the world from a place of water scarcity and water conflict to a place of water abundance, economic growth, and security. And we'll learn about JNF's role in this marvelous transformation. The program will wrap up at 9 a.m., followed by additional time to talk with each other. And if you'd like, ask Seth to sign his book in the back. We're there for sale. So here we go. As Nadav and Seth will share, the world is water poor. And the situation is getting worse due to population growth and, more importantly, demand for agricultural products and rising quality of life. Add in misuse and pollution, and you have a supply demand mismatch. This is not a warning. It's happening all over the world today, with consequences in nutrition, commerce, and sometimes national conflict. And it seems to be worsening. The question is, are those dire consequences inevitable? Can water scarcity be fixed? My message to you today is, the supply and demand curves of water can be bent. Instead of veering farther apart, supply down and demand up, they can be brought back together. Our speakers today will tell you how it is already being done. When former Governor Deval Patrick visited Israel for the first time in 2011, he took our delegation to visit with Shimon Peres. The trip was be the beginning of my journey to understand the amazing Israeli water industry. The president told us a sad fact in an amusing way. He said, I won't do an imitation of his voice, I thought about it, but. <laughs> Israel is a land of only two lakes, one dead and one dying. In retrospect, his observation turned out to be the low point of an amazing decades-long voyage that turned Israel from a place of extreme water scarcity to a place of water abundance. In fact, Israel has transformed itself from an arid desert to a green land. Today, while Israel's natural environment has not magically produced more water, its engineered environment demonstrates what is achievable with ingenuity and determination. As Seth Siegel will soon tell us, the Israeli government, its people, the universities, industry, and nonprofits like JNF have pursued an enlightened strategy of resource management, effective oversight, accurate pricing, consumer education, record setting recycling, breakthroughs in desalination, pioneering drip irrigation, and big data to produce an amazing feat. Today, not only does Israel have all the water it wants to produce, but it has used its water resources to pursue peaceful economic integration with its neighbors and assist the world in achieving the same objectives. This feat was not a moonshot. It was a determined accomplishment made all the more impressive because it is replicable across the world. It really is nothing short of a man-made miracle. The ramifications of its success can change the world forever. First up, I'd like to share with you a brief video about the Salatech and its work with Harpoon Brewery. Far, following the video, I'd like to call up Nadav Efrati, the CEO of the Salatech, a company which exemplifies Israeli water tech, successfully bringing its innovation to global markets, changing the industrial footprint for water users around the world. The company's US headquarters is right here in Newton. And it has been a darling of our local export economy, as you can see here from an award bestowed on Nadav by Governor Baker, and during a trade mission to, to Japan with Governor Patrick. Roll the video, please. The world is running out of fresh water due to global warming, population growth, increased industrialization. Traditional freshwater sources, including surface water and groundwater, 
are becoming strained and increasingly unavailable. Every product we use requires water for its production, from food and beverages to automobiles, cell phones, to power production. Everything requires fresh water. Therefore, there's an increased need to use non-traditional sources of water supply. Desalitec is in the business of supplying that water more efficiently than any other reverse osmosis method. So for this project, we're gonna be taking Charles River water and purifying it at a recovery rate of about 94%. So a typical brewery consumes seven gallons of water for every gallon of beer it produces. A high efficiency, more sustainable brewery can get that done with two or three gallons of water for every gallon of beer it produces. And Desalitec helps breweries achieve that by providing higher efficiency, higher recovery water treatment systems for ingredient water and for helping these facilities reuse their wastewater. Typically for a Desalitec customer, they'll get a return on investment for purchasing their system within a year based on savings in water supply and savings in reduced sewage fees. Desalitec systems are able to convert water sources like this into purified water for industrial water use and for drinking use. Water is the largest ingredient in beer, after all, so Harpoon was delighted when Desalitec got in touch with us about brewing a beer and using water that had been through the Desalitec system. We just love this irony of using Charles River water to brew a beer on the one hand, but also the total confidence that we'd be using a beautifully purified water that'd be perfect for the brewing process. Today we're brewing Charles River Pale Ale. I've been here at Harpoon for about 22 years, and uh, we've always used regular Boston municipal water, but this is the first time we've used river water in one of our brews. The Charles River, thanks to any number of private and public partnerships, has made tremendous strides here in the Boston Harbor. The cleanup there has been impressive. With all that progress, though, we still wouldn't be able to use those water sources directly for brewing. But with a Desalitec system, we're able to have the beer that's being brewed right now and we'll enjoy in a couple of weeks. Please welcome Nadav Efrati. Thank you everyone for having us here. Uh, so, the world is running out of water and David couldn't have presented the story better. Uh, more people need more water to drink, uh, need more food, need more products, and the available water sources are kind of already pretty much depleted or put to a very heavy use already. So does that mean we're facing a catastrophe? Sometimes we read in the newspaper that, you know, water is the, the big, the big problem the world is facing. Personally, I don't think so. Uh, as a society, just like Israel demonstrated, we can generate all the water we need, just like we can generate all the energy we need. So it's, it's available. It may not be available in a specific point in time if we're caught unprepared, like California, for example, but as a society, this is not going to be one of the things which take us down. Uh, however, things will change, just like with energy, where you can generate energy, but it has environmental and financial impact, the same thing will happen with water. So new sources of water will emerge, and those sources are desalination, reuse, and of course, much higher efficiency in the way we use water. As mentioned in that video, and that's pretty surprising, almost every product around us have a lot of water in it and in its manufacturing process. So be it food and beverage, pharmaceutical, cosmetic, microelectronics, textile, uh, automotive, power, refineries, every, every product you see around you have so much water that are used in order to produce that. And it's not just water, it's typically purified water. 
uh, water, they take tap, tap water and well water and further purify it with reverse osmosis. So the water will be at a much higher quality and nothing will scale on their production machinery. So there is water in anything around us and this is pretty surprising that about 60% of the water withdrawal in the United States and in the developed countries is actually going to the industrial sector, not the agricultural sector and not the residential sector. So the industry is kind of already the biggest consumer of water in many places around the world and it's pretty shocking how inefficient the industry is. If you think about energy, our society have been uh, educated to save energy for many decades and we all switched our bulbs to LED lights and everyone knows that you need to turn off the light when you're not using it or put it, put it on timer. We are conscious of energy. But if you catch an average person here in this room and asking, are you saving water as well? Most people will say, I guess, not quite. Uh, the average Boston person is not aware of the need to save water, and why would they? We have all the water we need, right? We also have all the energy we need, and we still save energy. We save energy because of its environmental and financial impact, and water, uh, Water is actually a lot more than water. You deplete natural resources from one side. Yes, you will be able to generate more, but you cannot generate new rivers and lakes and ponds. And you have to cope with all the wastewater, which is generated pretty much from every drop of water we use. Uh, an equivalent amount is going to the wastewater, which is another problem. So the environmental impact of water is, in many cases, bigger than that of energy. And the financial impact is there as well. Uh, we just uh, had new sod in our backyard. And my water bill for June, July, August came at $2,700. I've never paid so much for electricity in my life for three months. Uh, we use, uh, I guess, excessive amounts of water. Uh, but, but it is expensive, and this is expensive for us as a household, for industrial customers, industrial entities here in the greater Boston area, they pay about $17 for 1,000 gallons if you take in the water price and the disposal price. And it, those water prices, being inefficient about water, is, so, is spending so much money that this is unavailable. And yet, a few weeks ago, I have spoken before a panel of uh, sustainability officers from many big corporate here in the area and they're all saying we all want to save water but it's so hard to justify it because the returns are not there and I'm saying in replacing your water purifier that currently wastes one gallon every three gallon it produces with one that will waste one gallon and every 20 gallon will return the investment in much less than six months and they're saying really we don't know that and they're the sustainability officers so the drivers are there. The environmental impact is clear to anyone. The financial side is already available. People are simply unaware of it. And part of our quest in the Salitec, and this is why we had all those trips with uh, the Val Patrick and our baker, is to simply bring awareness to the fact that water matters just like energy. We don't think that water necessarily matters a lot more than energy, but it certainly doesn't matter so much less. And the future I, I'm envisioning is a future in which energy and water will be bundled in the hearts and minds of people at, at the same level, and not in a so different one. So uh, our mission in the Salitec is to become the leading global solution provider of high efficiency water purification waste, and wastewater reuse uh, for the industrial sector and to bring new sources of, of affordable and reliable water uh, to the public, generally speaking. And we're doing a pretty good job, I hope. Uh, one of our investors is here. Uh, so <laughs> we're trying to be a, yeah. So uh, as you can see, this is a chart from Global Water Intelligence, the, the leading firm which covers the water sector, and it shows that the Salitec is currently the most advanced water technology company in the world. An interesting fact about this uh, chart is that from the four top water innovators in the world right now, not innovators, top most advanced water tech companies, there are many smaller innovators as well, but from the leading ones, uh, three out of the first four are Boston-based companies. Uh, pretty remarkable. 
Israel is great and we are building a very nice water community here with New Inn and, and the swim symposium uh, that was mentioned before. Uh, why are we doing, why are we taking this, why are, why are we being noticed? So uh, reverse osmosis is kind of the workhorse of purifying water for all those industrial and municipal processes. And as I've mentioned, it's exceedingly inefficient in terms of water usage, or at least was until we came along. And we typically work at water efficiency of about 95%. We waste about, we reduce the water waste by about 75% and we save energy and increase the reliability and flexibility. And some of the examples are, for example, Coca-Cola. We are working in several Coca-Cola factories, taking tap water and well water and purifying it at a very high, to a much higher level of purity. And then they add all the Coca-Cola good stuff. Uh, and it goes straight into the bowels, uh, and we're treating industrial wastewater and so on. Uh, some additional example from any additional sectors that we've mentioned before. Uh, and finally, in my remaining minute, some words about Israel and Massachusetts. So I think that Israel is a model society, uh, like Herzl predicted, uh, as far as it pertains to water. Uh, in this context. So uh, the, the society is, is very conscious and aware of the need to save water. The company has presented a nice model to the world by really proactively solving its water issues by applying unprecedented amounts of desalination, reuse, and being aware of water efficiency, all the necessary keys to succeed in that task. Uh, and of course, the, there is an almost infinite number of water innovators in Israel that are making a tremendous job trying to push this industry forward. Uh, we have relocated our company from Israel to Massachusetts about two and a half years ago, and currently we have half of our executive members that are Israelis, and the other half uh, are Americans. I'm kind of in between. I was born in New Jersey, as you can hear from my accent, uh, <laughs> but spent, invested all my life in Israel. Uh, anyhow, since relocating the company here, we really found great, great partners to help us promote our messages and commercialize our solutions. And, <clears throat> and from selling really a few systems a year, uh, we're going to sell it over $10 million this year and more than double that next year. <clears throat> and all of that really, since we've made that step relocating our headquarter here, and it's been great for us as a company, and it enabled us to hire many more people in Israel and many, many more people here. So we really found great partners, and now we really have two homes. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nadav, for that great story and for bringing us Charles River Pale Ale. On the subject of Israelis bringing the water ingenuity to the world, Massachusetts has been a great beneficiary. As you can see from these headlines, with the benefit of creating jobs and revenue in our state, as Nadav wonderfully described, Desalitech is a great example, and there are more. You may have heard of the desalination plant being engineered by an Israeli company in California, which would be the largest in the Western Hemisphere. The project finance for that plant, $1 billion, actually is provided by a Boston company called Poseidon Water. Coke Membranes, a $500 million manufacturer of water technology in Wilmington, Massachusetts, acquired an Israeli company a few years ago whose product has become the preferred membrane technology in biotech and other industries with sensitive water treatment applications. CDM Smith, the billion dollar water civil engineering firm headquartered in Cambridge, built the first wastewater treatment plant in Israel in the 1950s and recently stepped up to deliver on the demanding Israeli specifications for a record-breaking 11-megawatt cogeneration facility, 
attached to Israel's largest wastewater treatment plant. Perhaps the commercial invention of enormous success that everyone here knows is the sensor-activated faucet. Stick your hand underneath and the water comes out. It was invented by an Israeli MIT researcher, many of you actually probably knew him, Natan Parsons, who was frustrated with all the wasted water while washing dishes in his Brookline kitchen. The company continues today as Sloan Valve of Newton, Massachusetts. Nadav was also the founder here in our New England branch of JNF of the JNF Parsons Water Fund which pioneered a new way to provide renewable financial resources to the Israeli municipal water sector. JNF has been the leading nonprofit that has earned a seat at the table with the Israeli government and industry to advance the country's water sector success. It pushes broad visions and fills gaps where public and private resources don't go. JF, JNF has established hundreds of water reservoirs, built wetlands, funded deep water drilling, invested in water sensitive agricultural research, research, and restored rivers. It's not a cliche. JNF has helped the desert bloom, brought turtles and birds back to wetlands, enabled new jobs through advancements in export agriculture, and reshaped cities like Beersheba for economic development and quality of life. Okay. So you've heard now a little bit about Israeli water tech. You've tasted its byproducts, or still can later. You've heard about the connection to our local economy and the role of our local philanthropic efforts through JNF to take part in the Israeli miracle. Now it's time for the big picture from Seth Siegel. A little over three years ago, my friend Seth heard that I was leading a Massachusetts water innovation mission to Israel organized by CJP and the New England Israel Business Council. The trip was designed to introduce Greater Boston senior executives from our local water industry to the Israeli industry, especially for first time visitors to Israel. Seth, who is a brand marketing guru by profession and a good friend of Israel, called me to ask if he could join the trip. And I said, Seth, you're not from Boston. You don't work in the water sector, and you're already a frequent visitor to Israel. I need to keep this trip focused on our target audience, so thanks for your interest and no. Seth called back a week later. I have to go on this trip. I thought I could put him off a little bit by saying, I'll have to let you know if there's room. He called back a week later. I said, why is this so important to you? He replied, I'm working on something big. I'm not sure yet how it's going to work out, so I'm not really ready to talk about it, but I promise it will be worthwhile. I thought, well, maybe he was planning to invest in a startup or something, who knows, but if he wants to go that much, we should include him. So Seth came along. Here's the delegation, and Seth with a big grin, <laughs> underneath the Caesarea, or, uh, Caesarea Water Aqueduct, however you like to say it, Incidentally, an example of 2,000-year-old water innovation in Israel. Little did I know, it was all part of his research that led to his outstanding book. I highly recommend it to you. It's an easy read while being meticulously researched. If you love Israel, you'll learn things you have never read anywhere else. If you're a water person, it's a fascinating story and treatise. And it's now on the New York Times bestseller list. Pretty amazing for a book about water or a book about Israel. And Seth is humble about this, but all book profits are going to Israeli charity. Seth is an accomplished brand marketer. <laughs> Seth is an accomplished brand marketer turned community activist and author. Please welcome Seth Siegel. You, you know how these things go, they always, the speaker always says, thank you for that kind introduction. David, thank you for that kind introduction. That was quite remarkable. Thank you very, very much. I'm uh, somewhat awed to have uh, heard, this, heard the story retold. I was going to briefly, in my opening remarks, say thank you to David 
who is a remarkable community resource locally and nationally, to talk about how he helped ignite the spark for me. But uh, David told the story better than I could have. So David, thank you for having allowed me after, I think it was 11 phone calls, by the way, not three, uh, <laughs> to join you. I, what is it with you Boston people? How clannish could you possibly be? I thought it was, you know, I thought it was somebody else they saw that about. So, uh, but finally he did let me on, and he, although he made me wear a little I'm from New York badge the whole time I was there, uh, I was treated fairly well by almost everyone on the trip. It's really a complete pleasure to be here this morning, and I've been on book tour for the past six to eight weeks uh, around this book, traveling far and wide around the country, speaking to both Jewish audiences and, frankly, more so to non-Jewish audiences, which is somewhat startling to the degree to which this book has received interest from groups of engineers, universities, graduate programs, business groups, and so forth. It speaks to a growing awareness of the fact that we have a troubled water present and a possibly grave water future. Now, it's possible that we'll get ahead of the innovation curve. It's possible we'll all do what we have to do. But I would say that, frankly, in the US and around the world, our leaders, political leaders, our civic leaders, have permitted us to sleepwalk into what is a growing water crisis. Now, in water-rich Boston, you may not be feeling it as much. But I want to tell you how I came to write the book and to put some context in this. About four years ago, just before David permitted me on the trip, I attended a not very well attended seminar at a think tank in New York that I'm a member of called the Council on Foreign Relations. It's a foreign policy group. And what I learned at this seminar was that, and this uh, was taught by, uh, it was presented by a man from the US government from the National Intelligence Council, which is one of the key parts of our national intelligence infrastructure. This fellow, a retired US Air Force general, presented the rather remarkable fact that four years ago, I didn't know, it was before there was a huge awareness of California and California's water problems. He said that we are descending into a global water crisis, that by the year 2025, which then seemed like a very long time away, but now is only nine years away, he said that by 2025, 60% of the world's land mass would be experiencing water scarcity problems. I later learned from another US government report that said that by 2025, 40 of our 50 US states will be experiencing water scarcity. Now, leaving that seminar, I had two reactions. And I suspect, given that this is a JNF audience, I suspect that many of you might have had the same reaction. My first reaction was, hey, I'm a pretty well-informed citizen. How come I never heard about this before? By the time the word crisis gets in the sentence, I should have known about this, but I didn't. And the second thought I had was, as a fairly frequent visitor to Israel, was what is this going to mean for Israel? I knew a lot about Israel's politics, its history, its security situation. But what I didn't know, what I found out in the coming days, was that Israel, despite the fact that it's 60% desert and the rest of the country is semi-arid, that Israel has the world's most sophisticated water system. Now, for those of you who are JNF veterans, probably many of you already knew that. But for me, it was remarkable. So juxtaposing two remarkable things at once. First is hearing that we're descending into a global water crisis and realizing that our leaders are not aware of it. And if they are aware of it, they're not doing much about it. And on the other hand, learning that Israel has the world's most sophisticated water management system. I said, this is totally remarkable. It's a problem, but it's a problem with a solution. There's a role model for the world to follow, but here's the problem. Nobody knows it exists. Nobody knows it's there. And I say nobody. Obviously, again, some of the people in this room know about it, but not enough people know about it. So that was the day that I make the decision that this is a story I want to tell. Now, it's been a wonderful journey. I've been back and forth to Israel many, many times. I interviewed over 220 people for the book. I wanted to get a kaleidoscopic and 360-degree view of the water story of Israel, and I believe I achieved that. And then in the telling of the story, what I believe I have come up with, and I say this to a room full of people who are friends of Israel and fans of Israel, I believe that I, not by design, but stumbled upon perhaps the best story we can now tell about Israel. At the very moment that the world is going into a global water problem, at a time when everywhere, countries large and small, wealthy and poor, 
<clears throat> are facing water problems, at that very moment, Israel has an abundance of water. How great is that abundance of water? Let me give you some metrics. Let me give you some numbers that will help you understand this. When you generally look at a country's water problems, you look at two or three things. You look, first of all, at their population. You look at their economy. And you look at their natural available water. So since 1948, when Israel achieved independence, Israel's population has grown tenfold, the fastest growth in the world in that time period. In that same time period, Israel's economy, its GDP, has grown 70-fold among the fastest in the world. Now, those two factors alone should bespeak a huge water problem. Add to that that thanks to climate change, since 1948, Israel's rainfall has declined by 50%. And yet, even so, Israel is so water abundant today that it exports its water in many forms. First, as water to the Palestinians in the West Bank and in Gaza, to the Kingdom of Jordan, and significantly for people in the region who are now refugees from crises elsewhere. In addition, as you know, Israel has a multi-billion dollar export industry of agricultural products. And think about for a moment what really is agriculture other than value-added water. Take a seed, put it in the soil, maybe just in sand in the case of Israel, add lots and lots and lots of water, and you have a value-added product which you are then exporting. And only a country that would be so sophisticated and so confident of its water future would permit itself to export every year billions of dollars of tomatoes and peppers and melons and cucumbers and other products to countries around the world. Now, I tell all this story in my book. I tell how it came about. It's a book that uh, is not intended necessarily. You don't need an MIT PhD in engineering to follow it. In fact, I'm a liberal arts guy, and the hardest part of the book was trying to understand what they were talking about when they're talking about reverse osmosis and the other things that uh, our speaker earlier uh, seems to understand from the time he was a little boy. But, <laughs> But I, I think that I'll take a moment or two to share with you, and again, you don't have to read the book, it's all, it is, but this is in the book. One of the challenges when I decided to, tell the, to write the book was, where do you start the story? If you're going to tell a moving, dramatic, hopefully inspiring story, what's the beginning point? Now, frankly, one could start at the most foundational moment. The very first words of the Hebrew Bible suggest that before there were the heavens and the earth, there was the water. God creates the heavens and the earth, and on the face of the waters, there was chaos. Well, where and how was there water before there was anything else? So I could start by saying there was water before any other material thing existed in the world. But I chose not to go that far back. I could have also started back in the time of the Bible and talk about Moses striking the rock and how instructive that is, because God provides manna for the children of Israel as they wander in the desert, but God does not provide the water. He instructs man to be his partner in the production of water. I could have started there, but again, chose not to. And I was tempted to start the book in 1902 when Theodor Herzl publishes Alt Neuland, his novel talking about the future land of Israel and what the land of Israel will look like. And in his novel, he has his main character say that the heroes of the land of Israel will be not the generals, not the prime ministers, he says the heroes of the land of Israel will be its water engineers. So from its first days, before it was a country, when the ideology was still being formed, Israel chose to prioritize water and its water destiny over nearly everything other than its security and the ingathering and absorption of its immigrants. And it's because of that focus, as I tell in my book, that Israel has been able to achieve great things. Now, Perhaps all of you have been to Israel, but certainly many of you have. And here I will share something that is not a secret, and that is that in my many, many, many trips to Israel, both for this book and otherwise, I have met many remarkable people, very many inspiring people, but I've yet to meet a single superman or superwoman. Everything Israel has done, we can do. Everything Israel has done, countries around the world can do. It's just a question of having a plan and having the desire and the focus to achieve that. And that's, in fact, the essence of what my book is about. It's a blueprint. It tells the story of how Israel achieved this and what we all can do and, in fact, must do if we're going to avoid a dangerous world future. 
Now that man who gave that briefing, I mentioned at the start of my remarks, that man spoke of the consequences if we don't get this right, and they're grave. For sure, it means higher food prices everywhere. For sure, it means instability all over the place. He posited the possibility that it will mean the fall of countries important to U.S. security all around the world, important trading partners and allies of the United States, and one doesn't have to think very hard to understand that mass migrations of people leaving areas that have been deprived of its water will need to have to go to places where they hope they will find water. The instability that this will cause will be horrible, ruinous, and a historical epic that we don't want to experience. So if all the world will be a little bit more like Israel, a lot more like Israel in the way it looks at its water, its technology, its use of water, then the world can have actually a sweeter, happier, safer future. Now, I'll, I, I, actually, the part I like best about my presentations is the opportunity to engage all of you with questions and hear your comments. So I'm going to save some time so that we can do that. And I know they set up some microphones so that we can have a dialogue this morning. But I thought that I would take a few moments, I thought I would take a few moments to talk about how it is that Israel did this. And this is all recounted in the book. Most significantly, it's a revolution in agriculture. It's the use of technologies. <clears throat> it's the reuse of sewage and the pivotal, essential part of JNF in partnering with Israel in achieving these goals. And I want to close with this. It is often said that the wars of the 21st century will be fought over water. Now, that is certainly a possible outcome. I won't say it can't happen. But I want to posit to you a different outcome. And that is, as Israel has shown, as I speak about in my book, <clears throat> Israel has used its water for what a phrase I coin as hydro diplomacy, to open doors, to change minds, to establish diplomatic relations, to create new friends, to engage in commerce all over the world. Today, countries that would not talk to Israel, had no diplomatic relations with Israel just a few years ago, thanks to water relations, are now trading partners and diplomatic partners and sometimes even allies of Israel. Israel trades water technology with 150 countries around the world, including some of those who viciously condemn Israel in international forums like the United Nations. But water technology and water technology trade serves as a backdoor way of dialogue and communication and opens doors with these countries in the way that it did previously with others. So let's hope that water can not only just be a source of better commerce and good livelihood for people, but actually as a pathway to peace for Israel and for everyone around the world. I'll pause here, and I'll be glad to take your questions. So uh, David says that we have cut the questions, and we are going to defer it to later. So uh, bring it on. Not even one question? Bring it on later. Bring it on later. OK, thank you very much. A pleasure <laughs> to talk to you all. Thank you very much, Seth, for your words and your remarks. Thank you, David. Thank you, Nadav, for adding to this morning's program. Bear with me for a moment. Okay. So the creativity, the innovation, the entrepreneurial spirit, and the bold vision to both secure the future of Israel with a renewable and sustainable water resource program and to be a world leader in water technology that we've heard about this morning. I'm so proud and privileged to be part of the JNF family, knowing that our JNF projects have been instrumental in making this vision a reality. Through the JNF, we're truly part of the 5,000-year history of the land of Israel, evolving into what is today and what will be for future generations. We're making it happen. 
We've helped turn our ancient homeland into the world's most remarkable startup nation, the envy of the world. At JNF, we often say, no other organization makes a bigger difference. That's a pretty bold statement, but we can back it up. We're part of an exciting mission, one that merges our work renovating and restoring heritage sites with funding advancements in research and development and turning deserts into modern communities with economic opportunity and quality of life. As we've discussed today in a desert nation where water is essential, JNF has invested in building hundreds of reservoirs, water recycling facilities, parks, and recreation areas, all critical to enabling the country to grow and prosper. And now JNF's National Water Task Force will protect shared aquifers and develop new water resources to support the development of the Negev and the Galilee, enabling Israel to flourish and dramatically transforming what was a vulnerability into a source of strength and leadership in the region and throughout the world. Our Housing and Development Fund accelerates the process of building new homes in the north and in the Negev. Our work with Nefesh Benefesh integrates, integrates new immigrants, Olim, into Israeli society as we build comfortable and inviting communities, again, both in the Negev and in the north. Our task force on disabilities supports a vision of inclusion in the state of Israel, providing state-of-the-art assistance for those with physical and mental disabilities to improve their quality of life. These are just a few of the many, many critical JNF projects. As many of you know, JNF has developed a bold $1 billion roadmap for the next decade. It's an unprecedented strategy in JNF history, an extraordinary evolution from the origins of that little blue box. Not only is it an ambitious financial goal, but it's an ambitious and realistic strategic vision. These goals are achievable, but only with your support and participation. On a personal note, as some of you who know me, uh, in 1949, my father-in-law, who was a farmer in Connecticut, went to Israel to help start a farming kibbutz near Afula. He helped teach farmers techniques that he learned here in the United States about farming. It was his contribution in 1949 to the establishment of the new state of Israel. He was a strong supporter of Israel for the rest of his life. That was the example he set for his family. So I often ask myself, what can I do? What should I do? How can I be part of something much bigger than myself? For me, I've answered that question with my time and my financial support of the Jewish National Fund. It is so much bigger than any one of us. Its roots are based in the ancient history of the Jewish people, but with the current vision of a remarkable, strong, and world-leading future for Israel. We don't need to teach pioneers how to raise chickens in a fulo anymore. But the challenges that Israel faces, although very different now, remain real and difficult. Ask yourself, what can you do? What should you do? You can be part of something much bigger than yourself. Each of us can be part of Israel. We can contribute to its continued growth, development, Vitality and strength, this is an incredible opportunity for us all. So I invite you to join our journey and our JNF family.
be a part of our vision, be a part of the future of Israel, contribute your time and your money. You were each given a pledge card when you checked in. Please again, join us in turning our JNF vision into reality. Please consider a generous gift to the JNF now. Our goal, and we are very driven by goals, is 100% participation this morning. Help us achieve that goal, give generously, and please give as much as you can. Let me pause for a minute. You all have the cards on your table, and we'll resume after you've handed your cards to our table captain. Thank you very much. David, please join me now for the closing. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, for your leadership. Thank you, Steve. I'll wrap the program and you can keep talking. So just give me another minute, please. <clears throat> Seth's already in the back, but I want to say, Seth, wow, this is an inspirational story that you have put together about water, about Israel, and about the potential for bright prospects regarding humanity and water. You have set us thinking today about how the future is in our hands to create a world of clean, abundant water and reduce conflict based upon the Israeli lessons you have brought to us. Thank you, Seth. I think the message of the, this morning is that the course of water supply and water demand are not fixed. We can bend their arcs. We can increase supply. We can moderate demand, even as population and quality of life increase. The possibilities have create, been created and demonstrated in Israel. The rest is commentary, and the future is up to us. Thanks to everyone who made this morning happen, Nadav Efrati and the team at the Salatech, Rick Stover and Osher Perry, Seth Siegel, the table captains, the lay leaders of JNF, the Marriott staff, and for the JNF New England team, Sarah Hefez, Rami Hazan, Josh Talab, Melissa Schwartz, Golly Gordon, Karen Katz, Sydney Sador, please join me in a round of applause.
There's some Charles River Pale Ale waiting for you. Let There Be Water is on sale in the back. Seth is ready to sign books. Please think of JNF in your year-end charitable gifts. And most of all, thank you for being here this morning. <laughs>